Customers want fast and frictionless digital experiences, yet also expect protection against breaches, privacy violations, and fraud. Drive engagement by optimizing security and convenience to attract and retain customers. Use the Ping One cloud platform to build, test, and optimize digital experiences. The no-code orchestration engine weaves together authentication, user management, and MFA, all of which can enhance security, drive engagement, and boost revenues. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ping identity to learn more. Attacks can't be prevented, but they can be stopped. Modern cyber attackers have already made it inside your network, but you have the upper hand. Find and eradicate threats with extra hop network detection and response and shut them out before real damage is done. Learn the advanced techniques attackers are using and how extra hop stops them with a live attack simulation. Register at securityweekly.com forward slash extra hop. That's extra H O P. Welcome back to Enterprise Security Weekly. Do you have a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover in one of the shows? Submit your suggestions for guests by going to securityweekly.com forward slash guests and completing the form. We review suggestions monthly and we'll reach out to you once reviewed. And we we really do go through those. It's kind of like Christmas, opening that up and seeing what, what people have submitted. Something, it's something exciting. Yeah, it just depends on who's submitting it. All right, and you can follow along with us uh, with today's news. Uh, we've got a little uh, hiccup with uh, securityweekly.com right now, but you can go to scmagazine.com forward slash podcast dash episode slash enterprise dash security dash weekly. Uh, we'll, we'll link it on the on the disk. But it's episode 290. I'm sure you can probably search. Go to scmagazine.com. All right, so lots of funding this week, just a phenomenal amount of funding this week. And um, and it's interesting because some of it's coming from inside the house. We've got Sentinel One launching a $100 million fund and uh, CrowdStrike uh, doing a couple fundings here. We've got uh, uh, story number 12 and 13 are CrowdStrike's investments and uh, and bikes picking up $100 million. So it, we don't know. Kind of goes back to our... But it goes back to our first segment, huh? Around uh, the the different insights of technology companies starting to get involved, which I think is a great play. It is, it is, and I mean, even traditional VC, you know, like the these funds only get raised like every three to six years, something like that. So, you know, that this market downturn, but like, you know, the LP cash is already in the fund, so you know they they have to deploy the capital. Um, they're maybe doing it a little bit more. Uh, um, carefully, you know, than than they were before valuations took a took a bit of a dive, but uh, but they still have to deploy it. It's a good I time though; it's better be bang really for their buck, honestly. Go ahead, Katie. I think this will be really interesting to watch because this is, in many ways, nuanced from the, these bigger players, the Sentinel ones, the Crowd Strikes, actually buying companies. There's almost this fine line between, hey, I'm investing in you and I'm buying you to a degree. I mean, you could make a case that it's astronomically different because it's just, hey, giving you money. But we all know that investors are advisors. Investors are sanity checks. They do a whole lot more than just give the money. So it'll be, I, I think pretty interesting to watch as these funded companies come up to see where they go, how they develop their products, what markets they're in, how they align with the umbrella company, so to speak, or, or, or in this case, the, the funding source. Um, because this gives the companies who are, are supplying the funding a lot more say in how the market progresses than if it were just an independent financial company. Yeah, no, and it's it's uh, definitely some of it's strategic. You know, I've even seen cases where you'll see like three employees leave, uh, you know, a company like Cisco or Palo Alto Network or something like that, go off, uh, start a company that's funded by Cisco Ventures, or I think Palo Alto also has an investment arm. 
uh, and, and then eventually that'll get acquired back in. And basically, you know, it's a strategic way to 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 innovate. You know, to you know, you know, a smaller team and this trusted team has done it before. Uh, you just have them go off, uh, you know, found a separate company, and um, if it, if it works, you know, whatever they're building works. Uh, you acquire them down the road. If it doesn't, you know, it's it's uh, you know, not not all your investments work, so you you uh, you spread them out. It's actually a pretty brilliant way for these larger companies to. Um, uh, t- to encourage innovation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and an interesting story. Uh, Invincia, uh, back in the day, was was really the only competitor to, to Bromium, and they were doing um, process isolation on the host, specifically with browsers, but, you know, they, they also expanded it out to, like, office apps and, and things like that as well. Uh, Bromium called it micro-virtualization. Uh, technically, Invincia was doing it a little bit different, but Invincia also had, they were getting some DARPA funding to do some other projects. Uh, and they actually had a um, kind of like a skunk works, uh, you know, that, that was managed separately. It was, it was kind of like a subsidiary. And one of those projects was basically a, a next gen AV, like a machine learning based uh, malware detection project. And w- when they realized that the, you know, the, the micro segmentation, you know, that that kind of uh, isolated browser uh, approach just wasn't didn't have a market fit, you know, wasn't wasn't really getting them the growth that they needed. Uh, they, they pulled that project, uh, pivoted into next gen EV and in like two years got acquired by Sophos for, I, I think, two hundred million dollars. So they're able to do a really quick pivot into a different market because they kind of had this. They, they called it uh, Invincia Labs, you know, where they had kind of these skunk work projects, some of which were, were funded from uh, government grants. All right. Um, let's see. There's, uh, there's been a lot of... Um, Third-party risk management, compliance-related uh, stuff here. One I thought the, was uh, the particularly the Immunify one's really interesting. The DeFi, uh, the DeFi one for Web three bug bounty. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. We talk talked about, about that one on uh, BSW a little bit, where we're trying to figure out it, does that make more sense from a company standpoint to launch and have a separate Web three bug bounty as opposed to rolling it into their current bug bounty platform. And, and a lot of the argument I made was was around that. Like I think that is a great idea just because of the nuance and talent that it attracts and the people that may not bid on it because it's, you know, or see it because it's in the a lot of noise with the regular bug bounty as, as opposed to Web3 specific stuff. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. I mean, that, that was my first question when I saw this was, you know, do we, do we really need uh, – niche bug bounties but uh, if we need them for anything it's probably going to be you know in 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 the uh smart contract area and in web3 and like like that stuff is is uh a significantly different crowd than i I think your your typical bug bounty crowd yeah it's very hard to attract that talent and get it out there uh for people to to look at that are specifically uh, technically apt to do those kind of tests. So I think it's a good thing. So they raised quite a bit of money too. So I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> the motivations are going to be different. You know, the payouts are going to be different. Uh, I, I would say you're probably more likely to see cash or, or some form of currency payouts uh, with, with a web three bug bounty platform than you would on a, on a more general purpose uh, platform. But it's uh, it's too bad we didn't we didn't get the chat about this with uh, with Casey. <laughs> we, had, we had Casey on Paul Security Weekly last night. If if anybody missed that, um, would have been good to get his input on this since he founded uh, Bug Crab. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that would have been a great great kind of insight to to see what he thought about that. I obviously wasn't there last night, so my bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Is this the one I'm thinking of? Is it evident? Oh, so evident evidence interesting. Evident is um, I'm not even sure if this uh, is cybersecurity. This is insurance verification. So I, I, I didn't realize that this was even a thing before seeing this. Uh, COIs. You know, the, the idea that um, so it's third party risk management that's making sure your third parties are properly insured. You know, so not the most exciting thing in the world. But um, well, but yeah, it will trickle over eventually into like your your cyber cyber liability insurance, right? And as those policies begin to become more stringent, and procurement departments are requiring that at a level with verification and validation from specific vendors, uh, you're going to start to see that trickle over into our space pretty heavily, I think, in the near future. Yeah, I mean, there is some overlap there. Like a lot of it's just making sure you've got certain documentation in place. You know, you you could throw you know SOC two I seven twenty seven. Uh, thousand you know under some of that and it's just it's trying to i mean the main innovation there isn't isn't all that innovative it's just automating the uh the evidence gathering and, and uh and, and just building and maintaining that library of evidence you need from your third parties for, for due diligence Speaking of due diligence, Biden uh, Biden dropping some some money for state and uh, local governments. I'm curious what anybody else thinks about this. I've got some very uh, specific opinions and <laughs> yeah. So like so we hear. we've covered this on the show a little bit before. Not not this particular story, but funding available for cybersecurity improvements has been available to um, utilities. You know, p- particularly water utilities for a while. And, and we just see, like a lot of people, there isn't uh, either the level of awareness that that those funds are available, or two, they just don't have the staff necessary to leverage it. Like, I mean, just making money available isn't enough to get security things done, right? Like, like you still need some kind of security staff, which you know a lot of these groups just don't have. You know, they they don't actually have the people and staff to take advantage of those budgets. So you can't just throw money. At them. There also have to be people who know what to do with that money. That yeah, was, that was kind point. of my whole problem with it was the fact that like CISA itself is already overrun. We're, you know, two or three years out for, for a lot of the assessments and, and pen tests that they're trying to provide. So the how in which we take and get uh, the government side of this help with with funding that doesn't really make sense until there's a collaboration and cooperation and the government is outsourcing and using contractors or trusted contractors to begin to take some of that backlog and help uh, do some of these tests and provide remediation actions after the tests for the these government entities that's the only time that this is going to work with the current setup there's no way for the government to catch up and actually provide any additional support uh, without the people to do it and we're already on a shortage there, and, and government pay is not that great. So we're still not attracting that level of talent uh, into the government to, to kind of cover down on this additional requirement. Yeah, it's, it's a great point as far as uh, the money being available is is very helpful and useful. Uh, although, unfortunately, I think a lot of times that money gets spent on tooling or you know blinky boxes because yeah. you can't necessarily, as Adrian said, bring in someone else uh, to help out. Like that's not staffing another position because it's a one-time deal, so to speak. I think one of the challenges that I've, I've certainly seen in my career with government is, uh, you know, they have a certain amount of money that they can use for the year, and then they've got to spend it. If they don't spend it, their budget can potentially get cut, uh, and certainly sometimes will get increased. But it's it's in that situation where you end up holding on for certain projects, holding on for certain things that you can spend money on, but then since you're not certain about that money being available, such as this this situation, in in years out years you don't know that you can hire another person to actually fill that role in order to handle the things you need to. The money can be useful if you have a backlog of systems that need to get upgraded, or uh, maybe you want to do some assessments. Absolutely, that, that, that works there. But even if you get some security assessments done, you may not have people that can actually implement those recommendations or do the research that's needed in order to, to prioritize and figure out what should we do now? What can we do later? Um, I think it'd probably be more helpful if there was if this was staged over a number of years and there was uh, step ups to it where you know there's a certain amount of money for year one, additional money for year two, so on and so forth. So that way these uh, states and other organizations within the states can actually plan for 
what what that strategy is in order to incre- increase their cybersecurity and providing some guidance and recommendations with that money and some checkpoints would probably go a long way saying this is what we want to see and these are the the metrics that we want you to hit for that without it being overly bureaucratic which is the other side of it is there anything more depressing than doing a year five assessment with a client and finding the domain admin account you created on year one with that same client. Global I would hunger. say yes, but I've that, never that's seen that's that. That's about the same. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, and that is the, so, so I'm actually giving a, a, a keynote that's kind of on this topic here on like, w- what are the elements that are missing here? You know, w- within cybersecurity, uh, you know, largely with the economics here where, you know, we found like, we got all the budget that we asked for. We got the people we asked for, you know, but bad things are still happening. So, okay, what, what's missing? And so about 10 years ago, I started, you know, just combing through all the, all the breaches I could get my hands on, all the breach details. And it, it almost always comes down to broken processes. You know, like, like, sure, they bought the blinky boxes, but nobody took time to set them up correctly or configure them in a, in a useful way or, or test them at all like you constantly hear stories about um you know ndrs and ids ips plugged into the wrong ports you know not seeing the right traffic uh because nobody took that step of actually doing uh, an active you know like it's one thing to have a pen test it's it's another to have somebody sitting there um saying we should have detected that why didn't we detect and then fix it well most tools are are there let's be real you're yeah, your your return on investment and your investment is only valid if you get outside of the defaults. Even even with Active Directory, Microsoft stuff like the defaults suck. So that tuning and getting that the tuning of that appliance, that tool, that EDR, getting the telemetry, getting all those configurations done, that's where the real value comes from the tools, and that's the step that's getting skipped. A lot of these products are fantastic products, but they have to be configured and they have to be tuned, and no one's doing that. In fact, even yeah. the vendors themselves are not providing great guidance on getting to a better default state and or enhancing that default. And and that's the key right there, Tyler. I, I, I get so frustrated when I see vendors that provide a solution solution and there's so much more that needs to be done i always see customization or customizability in a, in a product as complexity uh, because the more you can customize it often you don't get a lot of things out of the box you have to then figure those things out um, when it comes to event monitoring event alerting one of my biggest fr- frustrations is that you there's plenty of systems out there that will aggregate your events but very few of them have some automatic tuning and some some alerts right out of the box that say, these are the things you really need to be worried about. And sure, you can customize additional things for in your environment to tune those better. But I think that's where it comes out. And, and I'm concerned that the money be used to buy the Blinky boxes, buy the, 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 the SIM or the event monitoring system, but then the tuning doesn't come with that because they don't have money for that part of it. Or that's meant for the next year, but then the government doesn't have money to help with that as well. Q government shelf. Guys, last week I was railing on Adrian on, on this point of vendor accountability. Um, I could have used your backup. That would be great. Um, I think this, you know, I, this is a little bit of a band aid. Um, I think it's a good intention, but I think there's also a problem of accountability because this money will be helpful in some ways, like you've all just said, but at the end of the day, it's not like you can shut down an agency, a government agency for not following these things. Can you take back the money? Uh, Probably not. So, so there's a little bit of an accountability problem here. I think the, the intention is a good one, but in practicality, for all the reasons you've mentioned, it it's not going to work. Just like so many other of these directives slash initiatives have have sort of fallen through the cracks, or it's taken eighteen times as long as as expected for anything to move forward. It's all accountability. We lost Adrian. We lost any sense of direction. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of direction and supply chain, <laughs> so smooth. So, um, 
I actually had other thoughts on that topic, but uh, but you know, then my my brain went somewhere else and my ADHD took over. So yeah, let, oh, let's sorry. Re- my fault. Did I do that? Did I derail you again? No, oh, that is uh, <laughs> I, I, any help for my brain to to uh, derail my focus. <laughs> um. Yeah, let's see where else to go here. So, Ox Security was interesting. I, I, I don't like the marketing, but uh, the tool seems like it could be cool. Um, Thirty-four million dollars in seed funding is a lot of funding, but those it are a lot of seeds. It looks like a single pane for everything AppSec. You know, so the CI/CD pipeline, SCA, SAST, DAST. I, I don't know if they have all these technologies natively or if they're kind of like like a Kenna or a Nucleus or a, uh, you know, one, one of these, like an AppSec style uh, roll up, you know, where you can import all your findings from all your other tools. And, and then it gives you a nice dashboard and kind of shows you, okay, here here's the state of AppSec, your, your AppSec in terms of everything from, you know, are you using uh, Russian MPS packages? Are you, you know, do you have vulnerabilities in your code? You know, like, like it looks like they're they're looking to boil that whole ocean and just beginning to end on software development. Here's all your problems. Does anyone know what the record for seed funding is? Uh, we, for seed we, funding? Just yeah, this show. 34 million seems like a lot for, for seed. I'm just curious... You know, I want to say, the, didn't we have like a hundred million dollar seed funding once? We've had a couple hundred hundred million, yeah. Yeah, I think we did, and it was just. But, um, I mean, it is still a lot for a seed round, but. Yeah, yeah. I mean, once you get to that size, it's it's almost like a private equity, you know, fun, funding something, and. and in some cases, uh, I've seen seed funding where they're actually combining existing companies, you know, that, that were bootstrap. Yeah. You take that level of seed funding, you're almost too big to fail at that point, And it provides a lot of really interesting problems to solve. And it, it, from a founder standpoint, you better make sure you've got a good board of advisors and you are set up to handle that level of seed funding and expectations. Cause there's a lot of nuance to that. I think they said they already had like three dozen customers. Yeah. 30 customers. They say, so, I mean, that's, Ooh, not, unless, that's big, big numbers. Unless you're a big company numbers. that was bootstrapped for a couple of years and then yeah. decided, I, I'm not a couple of years, actually, that for a, for more than a normal amount of time, that's a lot of funding to handle and to try to figure out because most companies with seed funding are, are very nascent, you know, two, three years in. But $34 million is a lot of money if you're two, three, four years in to try to you know, ramp up that quickly. Yeah, typically if you're bootstrapped and you've been around for a while, there, there's no, like, seed is pointless. Like, the whole idea of seed is, you know, you're standing up the company. Um, but that's the only situation where I could see, hey, we've been doing this for a while, we've grown organically, we have a bunch of customers, and now we're ready to really, you know, take it to the next level. Because, you know, 34 million, you know, 100 million, that's that's crazy money for a two, three-year-old company. Yeah, yeah, it is. And we've and seen that's that. a lot of scaling. <laughs> and we've seen it. Uh, so, like, one password was around for, what, like, 10 years before they took outside funding, and their Series A was 100 yep. million. So that's, a, that's a good example of that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, let's see. Any other fundings here that are interesting? Hush, Hush was kind of interesting. It's another one of these cases where the product is a consumer product. It's a consumer privacy product. But the the business model is for enterprises to buy licenses for this for their employees. So I, I guess the idea is, you know, more secure and uh, somebody who's more secure at home is also more secure at work. I guess I, I do agree with that, honestly. Like, and I, I think there's a lot less people leveraging that from that standpoint, especially with things like shared credentials uh, between home and and corporate assets. 
uh, shared devices, hostile networks. Like people just don't realize like how much bad nefarious stuff goes on your network with kids, iPads, and you know your your wife's uh, Pinterest shopping. It just it is not a great network to be on with a corporate hey, device. So. Hey, hey, no Pinterest bashing, Tyler. Stop that right now. <laughs> Nothing bad happens on there. But no, that that's a really good point because if you look at some of the products that have made their way into the enterprise, they started out as consumer products. And why did they make their enter way into the enterprise? Because consumers insisted, you know, consumers who were also CEOs and CIOs and CFOs and on boards of directors had said, you know, hey, I'm bringing my personal device that's way better than your corporate device. So you know, taking the model of, you know, instead of targeting enterprise, targeting consumers who might realize, oh, this is pretty cool. I can do it this way. And then trying to merge that with the enterprise experience. It, it, I, I think it's smart. Yeah, I mean, I'm getting some, uh, um, some strong vibes from, uh, what was the uh, LifeLock? Yeah, Norton LifeLock. Getting some strong vibes, you know, from from that you know that kind of consumer protection thing. And there's another company called uh, Delete Me. Uh, it's joindeleteme.com. That looks very very similar to this. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. We we had them on uh, PSW at one point, if I remember right. Oh, delete. Yeah, I I think I saw that one. Yeah, because they yep. were. Uh, yeah, got it. Got into the the details a bit. Yeah, so. The general idea is it shows you your footprint online and uh, ma makes it easy to opt out from stuff, to delete stuff, to remove stuff, you know, to, to some extent. You know, you, you can't delete everything from the Internet, but certain things you can do. Yeah. Again, I agree. The, the lighter footprint, the less stuff you've got shared, the more secure – home computing environment and habits. I think the habits is one of the things that is not necessarily uh, quantifiable or demonstrated, uh, but those habits carry over where they're used to using a password, they're used to using MFA, they're used to uh, doing those steps and actually having the security. If it's not there, then that throws a flag. So I think building that uh, more secure behavior out as a default, especially for home use, becomes a, a much bigger uh, benefit than what we actually can measure. I would be remiss if I did not mention that my company, a company I work for, not my company, uh, Tenchi Security, has a new uh, newsletter out called Alice in Supply Chains. Very, very clever name there. Play, play on. <laughs> was, it, was that all you? I'm sure that was all no, you, wasn't it? That was not me. That that was my boss. That was uh, Alexandre Sierra. But <laughs> um, but yeah, it you know it's it. Names are tough, right? Because when you say supply chain, like there's a lot of things you could be talking about. And, and really what we're talking about here is is uh, third-party cyber risk. So the risk that you get from working with suppliers, you know, their their breach can be your breach and so on. Uh, you know, that, that kind of supply chain. You know, it's interesting because I attended some, uh, a, a lot of supply chain and third-party risk management talks at RSA this year. And, uh, and like one of the examples given in one of them was, was like making sure sushi, uh, sushi is, is legit. Like, like there's a, there's this whole supply chain for, uh, you know, trying to prevent black market or, uh, fake sushi. Like one of the things they'll do is they'll take white fish and like, uh, under pressure push carbon dioxide. To it, which turns the flesh purple, which makes it look like Maduro. Um, so you can take like a cheap cut of, of fish and try and pass it off as, as tuna. As like and a, is there really that much profit? Like that seems like a lot of effort for a small profit margin. <laughs> I mean, carbon dioxide is, is cheap. Yeah, that's, that's not expensive. And, it's, and there's uh, a lot of fish swapping out there too. I mean, at restaurants as well, just because you can't get... Well, I, with overfishing, you can't get the fish that people tend to ask for, like salmon and bass and others. So you swap in something cheaper, and most people can't tell the difference with when it's seasons. The blockchain will fix it. Exactly. Exactly. I'm looking fake forward to sushi. That. Fake news. Sushi blockchain. Fake news on fake sushi. Um, yeah, not even joking. 
that that's huge. I, I don't know how big the sushi uh, or, or the seafood industry is. You know, I mean, this is definitely more like like higher end seafood is, is where you run into this issue. But um, uh, but in, in general, in, in in food, you know, you see a lot of. Uh, I remember the state of New York did a like went into a, like a vitamin shoppy or, or one of those places, in, you know, where they they have uh, supplements and stuff like that. And just start grabbing shoppy, by the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> That's <how it> spelled. <laughs> um, took it to a lab, and like a lot of that stuff, like they're they're like, this is sawdust. These pills have nothing but sawdust in them. These are, are just like ground, you know, it's it's just dried broccoli powder, you know, when it's supposed to be ginkgo biloba or something like that. Like a lot of that stuff just isn't regulated, so. You know, there's people getting away with, uh, yeah, and you just swallow a capsule, so you can't taste any difference, right? You know, so they're just they're just putting whatever fillers they want in that stuff until they get caught. It's the pink slime in McDonald's. Now, now we'll have to we'll have to make some kind of metaphor for security. You know, wh- where are the fillers coming in? <laughs> security what are, what are, pink slime. Wow. Let's see, Champ. I'm not familiar with this. Uh, I think most people know Champ uh, as a uh, your Mac MDM Mac uh, endpoint management tool. And uh, yeah, Champ has been kind of. I think most MDM EMM tools have been moving more into like endpoint security proper. But it looks like. That may be more of an MSSP move. What is it, that? It looks like uh, based on the no, article. No, they're a that... mobile mobile management MDM and IOCs for mobile platform and vi- uh, attack remediation or IOC identification. If I remember right, Zek OS yeah. has been around a little while. But pulling pulling logs from mobile devices, getting more insight yeah. into what's going on in the mobile devices, providing some threat hunting across mobile devices, which has historically been non-existent. So it's a good move for Jamp. Well, it's difficult to do on iOS, I would imagine, because things are so locked down there, right? <laughs> I mean, you, you're kind of limited for the the MDM like offerings, right? Like you've got uh, you've got your Google ecosystem and you've got your Apple ecosystem. For Apple, you've really got uh, a very limited amount of platforms. If you're not using like Intune and deploying through something like Azure AD. Uh, you're kind of down to uh, the Apple MDM and there's one or two others, but it's a small ecosystem that manages mobile devices. And with so many corporate mobile devices or bring your own devices, like I still think this is one of the dangerous aspects that people just don't really evaluate. Uh, and it's not, it's not highlighted as a critical business risk. I think it is less attacked uh, and I think it's still growing. I don't think attackers have really gotten as creative as they could or should be uh, on those. But like corporate devices and assets and sandboxing is not uh, the panacea that it is cracked out to be. There's a lot of glass uh, glass rooms over there. Absolutely. And mobile device mobile devices are probably the next area, Tyler, as Tyler mentioned, especially given that people are putting their Outlook mobile teams, Slack, other other apps that have data. And unless you're using a, a pretty solid MDM which has some controls around that, like Intune, uh, you're not getting much visibility on how people are actually using those. And a lot of times it's people with their own iPhone or their own Android device that are just installing the apps. They sure are, are authenticating to the, to the system. Uh, the MDM gets slapped down. It has a certificate, so now it has access. Uh, so th- this move makes sense for Jamf, uh, moving shifting from... You know the, the the Mac platform primarily, but also non Windows devices. Uh, mobile is a good play for them, I think, and a good addition. That's a really yeah, good. You point. Got- there was just a, um, a a major fine levied against 11, 11 banks for a total of one point eight billion for illegal app use, and this was primarily the the brokers putting messaging apps on their phones to communicate with clients. And they weren't authorized and they didn't have the right security controls and these brokers were communicating financial information uh, over these messaging apps and in some cases 
the firms, the the banks um, and brokerage houses that they were working for weren't even aware that they were on the phones. They weren't even aware that they were on the devices and they were being used. Um, so it's a it's a case of unapproved app usage um, causing major major problems. And you know if you look at it, eleven firms, one point eight billion, eh, and and the amount of damage that could have been done. Maybe that's not super harsh. But it's an indication that the companies absolutely need to get a better handle on what's going on, and, and they don't have it right now. You mean, hey, you mean CEOs put Candy Crush on their damn phones, or we have TikTok that has access to the clipboard where password managers are leveraged to paste passwords? You know, I bet you if we incorporated <laughs> Candy Crush into uh, MFA and things like that, they'd, they'd be used a whole lot more. Uh, Game, gamify MFA. <laughs> right. If you send me that link, I'll add it to the show notes, Katie. Uh, I, I think that would be good to add since we talked about it a little bit. Okay, I can do that. But um, yeah, just want to touch on a few more before we wrap up here. We'll have to wrap up in a in a few minutes here. Um, Sean, number nineteen. Are, I, I assume you're probably familiar with that, the enhanced phishing protection and the uh, what I teased at the beginning of the show when I said uh, Windows slapping your hand when you try and uh, update your password.txt file. Yeah, it's it's very interesting what Microsoft's doing in this area. Uh, really, they're trying to expand and get better visibility into what's happening when people are typing in credentials, certainly into the browser. So this is this is uh, focused on the Chromium browser primarily because that's what Edge is based on now. Uh, but also looking at uh, potentially malicious sites that are that people might be typing credentials into and, and providing some protections and interfacing in a better way. Uh, with Microsoft's ability to see into these things better than they have before, this enables them to catch and pr possibly prevent users from putting their credentials in when they're getting phished, uh, when you have that person in the middle attack where they're redirecting the user to a, a, a web page that is not the Microsoft logon page and preventing, uh, being able to prevent them from actually authenticating and logging on. I think it's a positive. Yeah, good stuff. Um, do you have a sense for how, like, how do they know it's a password that you're putting in there? That's a good question. I would imagine that based on the uh, the fields or the form fields that are in the site itself, um, looking for certain names and the way that users typically interact with it or interface with it, that would be my guess. Uh, I'd, I'd have to read some of the more details around it. I, I didn't see that specifically in the article, though. Yeah, because there was a... AI and ML. That's how they do it. There's a person behind the curtain <laughs> looking Stop. at all your passwords because they have Stop that... the mechanical machine. Turk. <laughs> Now I know why I got 22 burgundy shirts a few years ago, you know, damn. Always um, watching. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it wasn't, uh, this, this was, uh, there was a better link for this uh, that I didn't include here, but it, it had a screenshot and it showed somebody saving uh, a file to, to the Windows file system, you know, and, and there was a little dialogue box that says, uh, you know, can't let you do that hell you know basically yeah and it's it's notepad it's word any office 365 app all those are checking for something like that to to prevent users from doing something that probably shouldn't be done uh tyler knows firsthand how many uh passwords are, are stored in text files or pa password.xls files uh, and certainly <laughs> we, we learned from the uber hack at least what was provided that uh passwords are in powershell scripts which is a whole nother issue Companies that require their employees to maintain a spreadsheet with credentials in it, with clear text spreads in it. It's that's amazing. A, that's a big thing. Yeah. yeah that's legit. Yeah, it, it's kind of disappointing. You find these text files, and then you find the password in there, and you're really – the passwords, it's not the fact they're in there. That's bad. That's really bad. But the fact that the password is so bad that you could have guessed it, that's even worse. You had to go look for it to find that bad password not just guess it. <laughs> Amazing. 2022 plain text passwords in files on file server. Well, All right. Not if Microsoft uh, can help it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean that's that's why it's so interesting. That's why it's uh, that's why we're talking about it, right? Absolutely. Um, All right. Let's jump to our squirrel story here. Um, this story truly has everything. 
Uh, so, so the headline is three men charged with fraud in a hundred million dollar New Jersey deli scheme. And uh, there, there's pink sheets, penny stocks involved with this. You know, there, there's uh, biotech. There's uh, it's got a little of everything. If there's a lot to read, if you haven't read it uh, beforehand, it's it's probably too much to try and get through right now. But it, it, it's um, it's the kind of story. Uh, one of my favorite new podcasts that uh, you know, a friend of mine, um, uh, Lee Honeywell, turned me on to was is called Oh My Fraud, and it's two accountants that tell stories, amazing stories of fraud. And uh, and they go through, they analyze it from like a an accountant's perspective, like what are the controls that should have been in place to prevent this fraud? But some of this fraud, like people got away with it for 40 years or 30 years. Um, and uh, it's amazing how they get caught. And, and this one, they didn't they didn't get away with for nearly that long. But I totally expect to hear this on that podcast in the future. There's a lot here, like A for creativity on some of this. Like these guys just sat around thinking of ridiculous ways to scheme things. <laughs> these are these are like the hacky of uh, Ponzi schemers. I mean, how would you ca- would you categorize this as a pump and dump? Because it looks like most of the money they made <laughs> kind was of. by by pumping these uh, fake companies' uh, stocks on, on the uh, on the penny stocks. And then selling. Yeah, they artificially inflated the values of Hometown International and e-waste uh, the stock by a thousand percent, roughly twenty thousand percent, respectively. That's pretty impressive. Good returns. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a very interesting method to get some money but 20 years in prison that's a i don't know there seems like there's a lot uh safer avenues that wouldn't get you caught like the sec is pretty good at some of this stuff (laughs) you've got to have a a good exit strategy well one guy is still at large so maybe he'll get away with it yeah Yeah, i mean ransom seems like a safer bet but (laughs) one of the guys one of the guys uh of of course like several of these guys have a history of of stuff like this of uh of fraud one of the guys was barred by FINRA, and in, in that case, he was represented by, or he was defended by Ira Sorkin, who who's known for uh, representing Bernie Madoff. So, good company they're keeping here. Good company, or or foreshadowing. Yeah, yeah, really. I mean, it's and you you find that in the uh, in a lot of the stories that you hear on Oh My Fraud as well. Where it's like, how could we have known? You know, like one of the stories is like, all you had to do was a background check, and <laughs> you would have that this this guy murdered his grandparents and did 15 years in, in prison for murder, and maybe you wouldn't have uh, you know put him in charge of your city's bank accounts. <laughs> so fascinating stuff. It's. Uh, this is a conversation I've been having a lot lately, actually, is like, how close is fraud to cybersecurity uh, to the point to where I, I hear it's actually not that uncommon for some CISOs, uh, maybe CSOs rather than CISOs, uh, have fraud as, as as part of what they're responsible for under their purview. That's an interesting thought. Uh, I was just thinking that, you know, do you want Bernie Madoff's lawyer or do you not, uh, you, you know, from the experience perspective? Uh, but there was a show that I saw on Netflix called Connected, and one of the episodes of that was around numbers. And it was fascinating because someone figured out years ago that certain numbers appear more frequently than others. And so they were able to take an algorithm based on that and apply it to actually look at the Enron books. And using that algorithm, they were able to identify that the Enron numbers were completely fabricated just by looking at the way that the numbers were, were uh, represented in the books and, and shown. So if you extrapolate that and look at cybersecurity, there might be something behind that as far as how do you, how do you look at the, uh, the events that are flowing through the environment? Or is there something that is artificially pumping things through it or uh, removing uh, data or other things from within the environment? 
Not that take is, us uh, down a rabbit hole, but <laughs> is the prevalence of certain numbers a human proclivity or are they machine generated? In, in the uh, show, I believe it was human generated. Like humans are not good at ra randomizing or, or coming up with numbers right. that, that are fairly random that would match what the natural flow of that would be. Um, I do know that there are some organizations where insider threat falls under security, and that's a whole other yeah. interesting challenge, trying to figure out when people are acting yeah. uh, differently than maybe they should. They're working extra hours or working different hours. That's really tough to tell when people are working remotely or you know going into the office uh, occasionally. I've worked with several of the programs that, that were part of those, and it was very fascinating where you have a secret squirrel, to use the, uh, the graphic that's on the screen right now, um, <laughs> trying to move around the environment and yet uh, act as if what they're doing is normal, but now they're hitting shares, they're going to other locations that normally they wouldn't, including SharePoint. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah, that, that's really fascinating if you can figure out the likelihood, probability, whatever, of malfeasance based on patterns in, you know, if you're a financial person in numbers, if you're if you're not a financial person in in terms of words that are used, that 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 sounds really cool. I think fraud fraud is super interesting and. Tying it to cybersecurity is is always a challenge that I think everyone needs to continuously exercise. It's actually not as easy as people think to pull off a lot of the uh, money laundering or flushing crypto or getting paid out. Like if you start to think about a full attack from beginning to end where you're actually getting a monetary buyout and you want to get away with it cleanly, like there are so many pitfalls to that that will get you caught. So actually doing it well and finding those mechanisms in order to pull it off successfully takes a, a pretty strong aptitude to uh, follow that logic tree and a lot of knowledge with inside the finac financial sector to know uh, the detection points and capabilities of a lot of – it's AI and ML detecting those things that humans just don't see, those patterns and, and nuances of uh, anomalies. Uh, machines are very, very good at pulling those out and detecting those very quickly. Yeah, it's yeah, completely man. fascinating. I know that the three of you, your brains work very, very differently than mine. And I can't even come up with these scenarios, these attack scenarios. But in order to not get caught, you have to be meticulous. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, actually, know. that... that that's a common theme with, with fraud is uh, one of the red flags they look for is somebody who never takes vacation. Because once you start this fraud, you know, there's this fear that if you go on vacation, somebody's going to discover it. Somebody else is going to have to do your job for you, and they're and they're gonna they're gonna spot that pattern. Um, so so yeah yeah not so it, it people end up trapping themselves, you know. So they're they're like I said, there are cases where somebody you know perpetrated fraud for for decades, and it has to be almost relieving at the end because it's it, it just seems like it's so exhausting for them to keep this ruse up you know and they just can't take their foot off the gas ever yeah and i, I think the other part of it is it gets to a point where this is exciting and they want to see how much more they can do and what else can they get yeah. away with uh, you know and it almost becomes an addiction of adrenaline where it's like oh i'm going to try this oh, i got away with that okay they're definitely going to detect me on this nope they didn't get that that well that's crazy Yes, one woman owned and boarded over 400 thoroughbred horses uh, around the country <laughs> by the time she got caught. <laughs> Made a big, big auction to sell them all off uh, to, to recover some of the, uh, I forget how many million she stole from this tiny, tiny, tiny town in Colorado. But uh, yeah, I, th I think that's uh, it for our show today. Uh Thanks so much, Katie, Tyler, Sean, for joining me today. Always good Definitely to be here. Pleasure. Fun, thanks. And big thanks to everybody watching or listening today. Uh, before you go on to that next podcast, it would be great if you just took a moment to leave us a review, maybe on Apple Podcasts, somewhere like that. I think Spotify has reviews too. Um, but thank you for listening. And we will... I won't see you next week. I'll be out next week. I think uh, Tyler has agreed to, to stand in for me. Yes, sir. Awesome. So I'll see you. Uh, we'll see you back on the podcast uh, next week. I won't be here, but I will see you two weeks from now. 
Uh, but we're not skipping a week. So make sure you tune in next week as well. Bye-bye.